Church of Interlochen. And I thank you so much for being willing to take your time to listen to the message, listen to the music, and listen to the sermon. I believe God will bless you as you hear the Word of God. You know, Scripture says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So the more we read the Word of God, the more we listen to the Word of God, the more we watch different preaching services, the more we'll grow and our faith will increase and continue. This is September the 4th, 2021, and it being the first Sunday of the month, we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper. We're going to be having Holy Communion at the end of the sermon. So if you would like to put me on pause and get yourself a small container of grape juice and a small piece of bread, then you'll be ready to join us for the Lord's Supper. Or if you choose to, you could go ahead and wait till the sermon itself is finished and then pause and pick up and get your bread and juice. Just be ready to go whichever way you so choose to use. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer as we start our service this morning. Father of lights, in you is no variation or shadow of change. You are the fount of every perfect gift and the source of every generous act of giving. Father, you've adopted us as your children and have made us a royal priesthood calling us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Blessed are you now and forever. Jesus Christ, light of the word, world, and word eternal, you illuminate everyone and everything. Jesus, when the earth was cloaked in darkness at Calvary, when the sun refused to shine, you shone forth most brightly. By your resurrection, you hold all things together, making peace by the blood of the cross. Blessed are you now and forever. Holy Spirit, you have enlightened us and allowed us to taste the heavenly gift that we may serve others with glad and generous hearts. You freely pour your spirit upon your followers. You establish the church as a city set upon a hill as a lamp on a lampstand to give light to all within the house. Spirit, blessed are you now and forever. Worthy are you, holy and undivided Trinity, of all blessing and glory and wisdom, and thanksgiving and honor and power and might, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We're going to be starting a new series today on the book of Colossians. So if you would like to turn over to the book of Colossians in your Bible, you can follow right along with me. You know, I believe as a pastor, as a preacher, we are to preach the Word of God just as it's written, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, so we better understand the message as a whole. I'm going to be preaching from the New International Version, the NIV, but if you have a different version, it'll be very similar, but just might be a few different words, distances. So that's in Colossians, and if you would, look with me if you would at Colossians chapter 1. We see Paul introducing himself here. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. If you think back to our study in Philippians, you saw where Paul did not identify himself as an apostle there. He just said, Paul and Timothy, to the saints that are in Philippi. Well, Paul had a closer relationship with the church at Philippi than he did with the people at Colossae. From what we know, Paul never really even went to Colossae. He just knew of the ministry there that was started by Papyrus. So in order to show apostolic authority, he identifies himself as an apostle. An apostle is a person sent with a commission. And we know the 12 original apostles 
for the disciples that Jesus chose, and he made them apostles after his resurrection from the dead. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. That's who's writing the epistle. And now the recipients, verse 2, to the holy and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ and Colossae. Notice he uses the word holy. If you're looking at an old King James Version, it'll say to the saints and faithful brothers that are in Christ in Colossae. You know, you are already a saint because of the work Christ did for you on the cross. Some churches feel like in order to be a saint, you have to have lived a very, very holy life. And then after you die, somebody votes you into sainthood. And then eventually you're beatified and canonized and you become an official saint in the church. But according to biblical teaching, we are all saints. Why? The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. So when God looks at you now, he sees you through a pair of rose-colored glasses, through the precious blood of Christ, and you are a saint in his eyes. To the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. You know, folks, the whole Christian life really starts out with God's grace. God is the one who first reaches out to us and tugs at our heart through the Holy Spirit. God is the one who sheds provenient grace toward us to woo us into a relationship. And God is the one who initiated a love relationship with each one of us as his children, as believers. Grace always comes first. I've heard it said if you look at the five letters of the word grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. Christ's death on the cross bought us God's grace, and with that grace comes the idea of peace, that we have peace now with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said in Romans, therefore being justified by faith, declared righteous by faith in Christ, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I encourage you if you're struggling with peace, and you might feel restless to spend time in the Word and ask God to give you the peace that only He can provide. So from the centers of the letter, Paul and Timothy, to the recipients, the church that's there at Colossae, grace and peace, Paul starts out the main body of his letter here in verse 3. Verse 3, Paul says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. You know, I think it's interesting. From what we know, Paul never visited the city of Colossae. He only knew the one man who was the minister at Colossae, Epaphras. But he was still praying for people that he did not even know. We always pray for you because if we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that springs from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven. Faith, love, and hope. And that's really the title of this sermon. Faith, love, and hope. We have faith when we come to the point where we believe in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So you can look back at a time when maybe you were a small child in church, you can't remember the time, or perhaps you came to faith in Christ when you were older, and you can look back to that event in the past, and you had faith in Christ. Paul said, we've always been praying you because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and practically the love you have for all the saints. You know, the greatest thing you can do is love somebody. In fact, the Apostle Paul said the greatest act and sign of maturity in the Christian life is love. It's not knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, Paul says to the Corinthians, but love edifies. And I encourage you, just like the love they had for each other there in Colossae, the love they had for all the saints, that you practice that love. Love takes time and effort. 
I heard about a story earlier this week where a man here in the church heard about a widow that had a branch that came crashing down in her yard with a bunch of branches and everything. This lady's older, she's on a walker, she really can't get along and she couldn't do anything about it. Well, that man went over and tore those branches up and took on a haul all those branches and limbs off for her just to help her out doing something that she couldn't do. That's an act of love. I also think about a man we have here in the congregation, a congregation named Carl. And about a week ago, Carl came up with his own steam cleaner, his own carpet cleaner, and cleaned the Fellowship Hall carpet for us to get it nice and fresh. We're hoping eventually to return to having our morning breakfasts the third Saturday each month. And Carl came up just of his own love out of his heart and cleaned the Fellowship Hall. I think of Mickey and Tom and how they came up and cleaned up the Sunday school room for the children's church that we have on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock during the service and how they gave of themselves. Whenever you love, it's going to take time, it's going to take effort, and sometimes it's going to take money. But that's how we show our love one to another. And one thing I love about being here at the First United Methodist Church of Interlochen is this is a church that's full of love. I constantly see people reaching out to one another, sharing with one another, giving to one another, praying for one another, and that love is very evident here in the body. See how you can help somebody out. See how you can show the love of Christ to another soul. Might be just taking the time to listen to somebody, perhaps calling somebody on the phone or sending them a caring text, praying for somebody. Some way you can edify and encourage somebody in their faith. Look at that love that, the, uh, that they had here in Colossae. The love you have, and notice it says, for all the saints. Not just people we like, but sometimes people that might need a little extra more grace in their lives. They need to be loved on also. Everybody needs love. Love, we thrive on love. So make sure you practice that sort of thing. Notice that faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven. Folks, the greatest news that we could ever hear is we have a home in heaven when we die with our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, because I live, you shall live also. He told the disciples before he went away, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, you also shall be. When a believer dies, the Apostle Paul said they are absent from the body and present with the Lord. And it's stored up there waiting for you in heaven. You know, it's a common practice when a young couple get married that during the time of their wedding reception, they will save the top part of the wedding cake. And they will take that and wrap it up real good in cellophane or saran wrap. They'll put it in the freezer and keep it for one full year and then at the first year of their wedding anniversary, they'll take out that wedding cake, let it fall, and eat it together as a couple. My wife Carol and I did that, and it was such a good time of celebration. And I knew the whole year long that that cake was waiting for us. And sure enough, when our first year anniversary come, we'd be able to enjoy that. And folks, even though it was frozen for a year, you couldn't tell the difference after it thawed. It tasted as fresh as it did on our wedding day. God sees everything we do. God keeps records of our works of service and how we help other people out. And those treasures are stored up for us in heaven, those rewards that God has for us. And you can be assured that you have that future hope waiting for you. Faith looks back to the cross and is also involved in the present as we trust him. Love emphasizes our present activities among one another. Remember, Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know you're my disciples indeed, if you have love one for another. And that's the real mark of maturity is love. And I encourage you to practice that. And then in the future, we look forward to that final reward in heaven when we'll be with the Lord for all eternity. Faith, love, and hope. The faith and love that springs from hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel. Notice Paul here equates the gospel with truth. 
The gospel is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. He's showing that he is the only way to be able to reach God and that he is the truth. The gospel message, the good news, is that Christ is true truth, and you can really trust him, and I guarantee you'll find him to be faithful. How many times have we come across a politician or somebody in government or somebody somewhere that misled us and didn't tell us the truth? But with Christ, you have the truth, and the truth is the gospel message. Notice in verse 6, he said, The gospel has come to you as it has all over the world. This gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all his truth. You know what's interesting, folks? When you look back at the ancient world, the biblical world, the world around the Mediterranean, the Roman Empire, the gospel spread so quick so rapidly, but there was no mass communication, there was no television, there was no radio, there was no texting, there was no cell phones or any kind of mass communication devices, but one person shared the gospel with another person. That person shared the gospel with two or three other people. Those two or three other people shared the gospel with their families and other people that they knew and the gospel spread out, multiplying just by person-to-person -person personal communication. You know, most of the time when somebody gives a personal testimony, they share how a certain individual came into their life that was different, that shared the gospel message with them, and they wound up trusting Christ as their Savior and believing that kind of a thing. It's so, so important to, to be people that share our faith individually just like we're going to see in a few minutes by a man named Epaphras. The whole Mediterranean world, within about 100 or 150 years' time, had heard about the gospel of Christ, and eventually Christianity arises to eclipse all the old Roman religions. It happens because of the growth and planting a seed, and the gospel bears fruit. Remember, Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gives the increase. We can plant the gospel. Sometimes we might be the ones watering it, and God will eventually give the increase. So it was bearing fruit. It was growing, just as it's been doing since the day you heard it and understood God's grace and his truth. Then he tells them where they learned it from. You learned it from Epaphras. Now, we don't know too much about Epaphras other than the fact that he was the minister there at the church in Colossae, and he was the one that spread the gospel message and was really instrumental of founding the church there at Colossae. We're not sure if Paul ever even visited Colossae. In fact, over in chapter 2, verse 1, he said, there's a lot of people that haven't seen my face in the flesh. So he was probably never there, but he mentions Epaphras as our dear fellow servant. Epaphras was a servant of God. God had used him to found the church there at Colossae. He was a minister of the church, and he was a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, who also told us of your love in the Spirit. He had come to Paul and told Paul there in Rome when Paul was imprisoned. Remember, Colossians is a prison epistle, just like the book of Philippians. Paul wrote it in prison, and here he's incurring the church at Colossae. In fact, it's interesting, if you remember the way the the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians used the word joy over 15 times. Here in the book of Colossians, Paul mentions Christ 29 times. How could Paul remain so positive in the midst of negative world and all the negative circumstances around us? He focused on the person of Jesus Christ. And if you'll set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, and set your affection on Christ, Christ can keep you, I believe, as equally positive. Epaphras was a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and he told us of your love in the Spirit. So he bought a praise report about the church of Colossae to Paul in prison, which really encouraged Paul's heart, and I believe encouraged and spurred Paul on to write this message to them. Now, let's look at verse 9. For this reason... 
all that's going on at the church in Colossae, the fact that they're growing in their faith, they're showing their love. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not stopped praying for you. Paul was a prayer warrior. And I encourage all of us today, myself included, to be prayer warriors. Paul told the Thessalonians to pray without ceasing. Never give up on prayer. Keep knocking on heaven's door. The last two messages, the last two Sundays I preached in August, were all about prayer. Hezekiah's prayer for a longer life, which God granted. And then what Jesus says back in the, in the Gospel of Luke, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. There's that knocking again. Keep knocking on heaven's door. Paul was a prayer warrior, and he was a knocker on heaven's door. And that's what you see him doing right here. We've not stopped praying for you. And look what he's praying. Asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will. You're not sure what to do. You're not sure how to handle a problem. Pray that God would give you knowledge and understanding. You know, a lot of us have lived a lot of years, a lot of time. Uh, a lot of us in here anymore are no longer spring chickens, that's for sure, with myself definitely included. And sometimes when we've solved problems, we've taken care of issues, we've been responsible, it's easy to rely on ourselves to find an answer. But I want you to remember what it says over in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. He will make your path straight. So I encourage you, look for God's and pray for His wisdom in the situation that you're in. He'll fill you with the knowledge of His will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Again, I can be so much wiser as I study the Word of God, as I spend time with the Lord, as I'm reading my Bible, I'll be so much wiser than I was the day before if I let God's truth soak into my soul. You know, one thing Paul told the Romans, he said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You renew your mind through reading the scriptures, through yielding to the Spirit and trusting God to give you that spiritual knowledge and insight. And we pray this, he says, next verse, verse 10, in order that the Lord, that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Notice he wants us to live a life worthy of the Lord. You know what's so beautiful, folks, about the Christian faith compared to other world religions? Other world religions teach that you've got to do this, do that, do this, do that, all these different religious acts, and hopefully, if you're lucky, God might be pleased with what you're doing. The difference with Christianity, we're taught that God already is pleased with us because of what Jesus did on the cross. He paid it all. He makes us clean. He makes us saints. Now he asks us to live a life worthy of the gospel message. Not to be saved, but because we already are saved. Not to be accepted by God, because we're already accepted by God through Jesus' sacrificial death. In order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way. Sit down sometime and pray, Lord, am I pleasing you with my life? Am I pleasing you with my actions? Is there perhaps something in me that needs to be corrected and taken out? Or perhaps something put in? Ask God if you're living a life that's pleasing Him. In every way, bearing fruit in every good work. Again, works come into the picture. Not to be saved, but because we are saved. Not to please God, but because God is already pleased with us. And a lot of those works include how we're touching, how we're helping, how we're ministering to one another, how we're ministering to people. And not only people here in the church, but also people that we come into contact with in the community. What did the old hymn writer say? 
They'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. So try to be as polite as you possibly can be, as gracious as you possibly can be. Help somebody out when God gives you the opportunity and you hear about a need. See how you can do something for somebody else. It'll cost you time. Sometimes it'll cost you money. It'll cost you effort. But if you do that, I really believe you're being Christ to that person. Reminds me of the old poem that I heard years ago. It said, Christ has no body now but yours. No eyes, no hands, no feet but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks with compassion on the world. Your feet are the feet he wants to do good. Your hands are what he uses to bless all the world. Christ has no body now but yours. Let him live in you. Let him refresh you and reach out and be his hands to somebody else around you. Bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Just like the Philippians, Paul with the Colossians, he wants them to continue to grow in their faith, looking back and realize that they had faith in God, they trusted him. In the present, they're trying to be as loving as they possibly can to all the saints, not just the favored few or God's frozen chosen, but to everybody, especially people that need a little bit extra grace. And then realizing that one day, all those things we've done are recorded up in heaven, and they're stored away for you with a good, solid reward. So keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on Jesus and do as much good as you possibly can. John Wesley is famous for one statement he made. He said, do all the good you can to all the people you can whenever you can. Keep doing good. And I guarantee you God will honor and bless a life that's like that. Let us have a word of prayer, and then we will go into our communion service. Father, thank you so much for the words of Paul to the Colossians, words of faith, love, and hope that are so important in the three great Christian virtues that you lay out before us. Help us to continue to trust you each and every day by faith, to be people that that love shine forth in our lives, and to realize the glorious hope that's waiting us one day when be with you for all eternity. How we look forward to that day, Lord, when every tear is wiped away from our eyes, there's no more sorrow, no more pain, for the former things are passed away. Give us the grace we need, Father, as this is a your work in your body. For you have told us we are not sufficient of ourselves to think anything is of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Trust you to the end, Father. Help us grow. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This time, hopefully, you do have your juice and your bread on standby. If not, you might want to pause me and go get those things. And we're going to go now into our time uh, where we have the Lord's Supper. In the United Methodist Hymnal, page 9, there's a service for Thanksgiving and Communion. And I'm going to walk us through that right now as we go into our time of Communion. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. 
Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty all who were oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, and delivered us from the slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, Father, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, a union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. This time, if you would, we will read together the Lord's Prayer in unison. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread that we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The body of Christ, which is given for you we partake at this time. Let us pray. Father, how we thank you for the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ, the nails that pierced his hands and his feet, the crown of thorns that was beaten down upon his forehead, the spear that pierced his side. Thank you so much that you allow Jesus' body to be broken that we might be made whole and live. Help us never to take his sacrifice as something like, Lord, as a given of the faith, but realize the suffering and anguish he went through just so we could be with you for all eternity. Same way at this time, we will partake of the cup. The blood of Christ given for you. Let's partake. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the precious blood of Christ, slain before the foundation of the world as a lamb without spot and blemish. Thank you that we were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. And again, Lord, a lamb without spot and blemish. 
Uh, when John the Baptist saw Jesus walking toward him, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And thank you, Father, through your grace, introducing us to the Lamb of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for the service. Thank you for Holy Communion, Father, which helps draw us closer. And help us never take for granted, Lord, all you went through, just so we can be with you for all eternity. Continue to do your work in our lives, Father, and help each one of us to do as much as we can to as many people as we can, as often as we can. In Christ's name, amen. Folks, thank you for being with us. I hope you've been encouraged by the Word of God. And I encourage you during this coming week to try to read through Colossians chapter 1. That'll kind of give you a little bit of an insight of what I'm going to be speaking from in the following weeks, because I plan on doing a series to take us all the way through the whole book of Colossians. So read Colossians chapter 1 if you'd like to ahead of time, and you can get a little bit of insight of where we're going in the Word of God. Remember, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Be blessed, and I do pray you have a healthy and safe week. Amen.